right. Try to get everything arranged here. All my papers. I want to give you an update this morning from Pastor Sen. Got a note from him about 7.30 this morning. For uh, those of you who are unaware, uh, Pastor, you recall that we've been planning this, uh, he's been planning the, the hike of the Grand Canyon coming up that he left for on last Tuesday to speak in a church and then make his way to the, down to meet the group at the Grand Canyon. He was on his way there when he received a call from Elisa that her brother, Les, had taken a turn for the worse, and she really felt like uh, uh, they're probably going to need to head there fairly soon if they'd like to uh, see him before he passes. So immediately, Pastor Sen made a U-turn on I-70, where he was at the time, and uh, uh, headed back home. So he did not make the, in the providence of God, uh, the pastor did not make his way to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. But he gave me this update. They sent the next day, they flew to uh, the area up in New York uh, State in Pennsylvania, there in that area where Elisa's family is. And I asked him to give us an update this morning, the latest thing. And he sent me this uh, note uh, to our church family uh, this morning. It says, Elisa's oldest brother, Les, has been battling cancer for the last couple of years. Recently, he was diagnosed with a, a fifth form of cancer, lung cancer. He has pneumonia now in both lungs, and despite all efforts to continue, uh, uh, to address continue to fill, uh, the doctors sent him home this past Thursday with hospice care after five weeks uh, of being in the hospital. Les is extremely fragile and at best can only handle very short visits. We were with him on Friday for 20 minutes. I was able to read scripture and pray with him. It was a very special time. And yesterday we visited him and he never woke up despite us sitting next to him and talking to family. Today we are going to attend church, a church plant near St. Peter's Village and then visit less after lunch today. We have uh, had a special time with my brother Bruce and with Elisa's family who have come from far and near to say their goodbyes to Les. His life is in the Lord's hands and we know that he will soon be with his Savior. Thanks for your prayers, Harley, Pastor, and Elisa. So that's this morning. So we're going to pray in just a moment for the sins in that uh, situation before we get into the uh, message today. I also like to, to mention as we pray that we'll re, uh, remember Lois Newswanger, one of our sweet ladies who usually sits right down over here, in this area over here sometimes. And Lois is uh, also in the hospital now, not doing well at all. And so I want to pray for her and her sister Linda in dealing with all the events that they have to. There's no other living family that they have, and so they have a lot of needs there. So we do want to pray for uh, Lois Newswanger today especially. And so uh, let's go ahead and, and go to the Lord in prayer now as we begin our, uh, this part of, portion of our service today. Our Father, we do come to you now asking for your help and blessing, especially for these in need that we have just mentioned we want to bring our pastor and Elisa before you right now, especially Elisa with her family and the uh, uh, very low condition of her brother Les that he's been on our prayer list for some time. And yet this uh, last week he's taken a turn for the worse and evidently does not have much time left. And we thank you that they were able to make it back there to visit with him and have uh, time with him to, to read in the scripture and pray. And that's a blessing. We pray that you'd be with the whole family through this very difficult time that you bring strength and comfort uh, uh, to them, and then at some point safety as they'll be making their way uh, back to, to Colorado. But we know all these things are in your perfect timing, and we know you're the great physician, and you are in control of all things. So we give this situation to you now completely, and uh, we'll trust you for uh, your uh, name to be uplifted and praised uh, for our own good as well, that these things are allowed to happen in our lives. Lord, we do remember Lois Newswanger this morning as well. She's been in the hospital, again, not doing well at all. And so we pray that you'd bless her, bless Linda, that you'd encourage them in a tremendous way in this very difficult time in their lives. So bless them now, we pray. Bless the time together as we look into your word. Give, give strength as I, as I speak and clarity that we might be challenged and blessed by the message from your word this morning. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so as the uh, pastor was looking for someone to uh, preach this morning as he'd be heading off out of town very suddenly that he was not expecting originally. Um, and I had been working on a message that I planned. Karen and I will be traveling this week to Montana and Wyoming. I'll be in a church next uh, Sunday, 
uh, near Helena, Montana, to uh, uh, speak on Sunday morning. And I've been working on a message and presenting the chaplain ministry for that church for a few weeks now. And I told Pastor, I've been working on a message. It's ready. I can go ahead and cover Sunday morning if that would be all right. So he immediately grasped that. So I'm, I'm preaching this morning. Uh, but pray for us. We'll be, we'll be traveling to uh, not only Montana, but then coming back through Wyoming and speaking at a, a, a pastor's uh, conference as well. It's the Northwest Baptist Missions and the Fo- Foundation Baptist Fellowship International statewide conference there in Wyoming uh, to present the chaplain ministry. So I appreciate your prayers uh, uh, for that uh, travel for us. Um, if, we were to, if I were to ask you for the 10 most talked about events over the last couple of weeks, how many of those would you categorize as bad or, or evil or just wrong? All the things that you've heard, whether it be social media, the news media, friends, neighbors, whatever they might be. It seems to dominate the view of our culture and worldview now, doesn't it? Uh, School shootings, violence in the streets, the war or or threats of impending wars, immorality, or frankly, just an abandonment of common sense. Do you talk about that much? Well, where should our focus be? As Christians, where should our attention be? be directed. I'd like for you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 9 and 10. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9 and 10. You'll see the scripture there on the screen. It says, O Zion, that bring us good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand. With his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Do you have any idea how many times that phrase or that word, behold, occurs in the scriptures? So I was researching this message and looking for it. I found that behold, or behold your God, but just behold, occurs some 1,298 times in our Bibles. Almost 13,000 times this specialized term, behold, has usually been retained as the most common translation for the Hebrew word henna and the Greek word edu in the New Testament. Both of these words mean something like, and you could come up with these, I'm sure yourself, but pay careful attention to what follows. Behold, this is important. Other than the word behold, you know, there's really no single word in English that fits well in most contexts. Although to say look or, or see or listen would be workable in some context. In many others, these words lack the sufficient weight and dignity of that word, behold. And given the principles of literal translation that we hold to here, it's important not to leave henna in the Hebrew and idu in the Greek completely untranslated and so lose the intended emphasis of those original languages that we have translated for our Bibles. The older and more formal word, behold, has usually been retained in our scriptures. And I think it's, it's the best available option for conveying the original weight of meaning. Perhaps a, a better way to understand the intent of that word behold in the scripture is to look at the, what is the opposite of the word behold, an antonym for that, to disregard, to neglect, perhaps to overlook It's the opposite of, behold your God. Notice that the word behold comes not only once, but in these two verses we read are on the screen, but three times. At the end of verse number 9, behold your God. Verse 10, behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. But Why are we to behold our God? Why should we not 
disregard, neglect, or overlook God and God's working. That may be obvious. We need to pay attention to God and what He's doing. But I think it's even more than that. We're instructed to, to behold our God. This wonderful chapter of, of Isaiah, chapter 40, we did not read the entire chapter. But in this chapter, it presents to us some 15 great things about God in this one chapter alone. And those things should cause us to, to direct us in our service toward Him, our praise toward Him, and worship of Him as we read the 40th chapter of Isaiah. Now, I'm not going to list those 15 things this morning, but I challenge you to find them in your own study. Why is that important? Why should we behold Him? We must behold Him because, number one, we have such a limited knowledge of Him, our eternal God. We need to learn more. That topic is inexhaustible. Our God is inexhaustible. We need to be learning more about Him every day that we possibly can. Number two, we need to learn more about how He works in our lives. Otherwise, we may miss God directing our daily lives. Number three, we must trust Him more. And the more we learn to know, or the more we learn about Him, the more we know about Him, it will cause us to trust Him. We need to trust Him more. We must behold Him so we will not be so distracted by the other things in life. We rehearsed some of those early when we began. Those events in life that consume our thinking oft times, all those things going on in the world around us. But behold Him. So stop what you're doing in, your, in your, the process of your daily lives. Don't miss this. And that's the purpose of us being here this morning. That word ecclesia in the Scriptures we find in the New Testament is literally a calling out of people from their daily tasks to meet together to be challenged by God's Word, to, to behold your God. Ecclesia. That's why we're here today. That's why we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, Hebrews chapter 10. Number five, we must behold Him because we need to do so in order to get through the pains of this life. We need to behold God, look to God for our strength, for those difficulties, the trauma, the struggles that are numerous among those who are sitting here this morning. I know that. I, one of the resources I recommend often to those I counsel when we're dealing with trauma, grief, and depression, uh, we just finished a, a grief share class a few moments ago assisting people in dealing with some of the most difficult times in their lives. But it's a devotional book that I recommend that focuses on that very thing. Behold your God. It's, it's, it's the, uh, uh, devotional dealing with the character of God himself. It's called What's So Great About God? It's by Daryl R. Ferguson. The idea is get your eyes off of yourselves and focus on God. That's an immense help in dealing with trauma. It's an immense help in dealing with depression. Focus on the character of God. Psalm 121, familiar passage, verses 1 through 4. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. One of pastor's favorite, favorite verses. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. He is at work constantly. That is the providence of God. I was reading a volume that was recommended to me recently when I was uh, with one of my friends who uh, I was telling him about the chaplain ministry and my desires to tell God, some of the incredible, miraculous things that 
I have seen happen, and I want to direct people's attention to her for the miracles that God does. And he said, you need to read about from the writer John Flavel. He's a Puritan writing in the 17th century, and he deals much with the, the idea of providence of God. John Flavel makes this one statement. He said, the affairs of God's people are managed by the care of God's special providence. It is the duty of God's people to meditate upon the things that providence has accomplished for them in their lives, especially during times of difficulty and trouble. It's our duty because, am I on the right slide? He's, we're commanded to do so. God has explicitly commanded us to do so. Meditate on the things that providence has accomplished in our lives. He's called his people to seriously think over the works, his works, both of blessing and also of judgment. Consider with me the, the exile of Israel into Babylon. God executed the most dreadful of all judgments to that people as a nation that claimed to belong to him. And he removed all the symbols of his presence from among them, the articles of the furniture in the, in the temple that were so precious to them. Then he called them to reflect on Shiloh, or to go there at least in their thoughts since they were in exile. They would remember what God did to that place where he used to dwell with them, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 12. Or consider another example of God calling his people and cons to consider and think over his blessings, not only judgment, but blessings. Micah chapter 6 and verse 5. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that ye may know the righteous acts of the Lord. That's like saying, if you don't think over the extraordinary providence, my righteous acts will be covered up and your unrighteous acts will be all that you see. When we fail to see what God is doing on a day-to-day -day basis, our focus goes back to those events, those 10 events the last couple of weeks that are so negative, that are so discouraging. If we don't watch for God at work, all that will be in view is this sin-cursed world, and that can be depressing. So, we're called to consider God's work of providence so that our faith will be strengthened and we'll think about our own needs. Matthew chapter 6, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Behold your God. The failure for us, of us meditate, not meditating on the providence. We need to meditate. And if we fail to do that, that is condemned all throughout Scripture. God is displeased by our carelessness and our in, in, inattentiveness. This is shown by the Scripture that says, Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 11. What's more, God in His Word threatens to promise and promises to punish the sins of failing to see His providence, see how He's working, failure to behold your God. Psalm 28, verse 4 and 5. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of His hands, He shall destroy them and not build them up. Isaiah chapter 5, as we continue, verses 12, the last part of that verse, and verse 13 says, But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst." God not only threatens but he actually strikes people with clear judgments
for this sin of failing to regard your God. Job chapter 34, verses 26 and 27. He striketh them as, a, as wicked men in the open sight of others because they turned their back from him and would not consider any of his ways. They failed to behold their God. It's our duty to meditate on providence, the providence of God. This is why the Holy Spirit has added remarks like, Behold to the stories of the works of providence in Scripture so many times. The kind of language invites and calls us to think deeply about these things as we should. Now, for example, one of providence's great and celebrated works of delivering Israel from their slavery in Egypt, and in that story in Scripture, you'll find a note calling for our attention added in two different places. Exodus chapter 3, verse, uh, the second, uh, verse 2 and then verse 9. It says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and the angel of the Lord, this is a Christophany, it's an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush, and he looked, and behold... The bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. God came. God did that. Did you notice? We need to remember. Or when God's providence defeated the bold Assyrian enemy. Remember uh, uh, Rabshakeh, who had greatly troubled King Hezekiah and all the people of Judah. There's a remark calling for the attention added to that story of uh, the, the story of that providence. Second Kings uh, verse, uh, chapter 19 says, Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword of, uh, in his own hand, in his own land, excuse me. Behold, your God. He did that. In the New Testament, also in the book of Revelation, each seal of the scroll contains some area of providence or an unusual series of providences as it speaks of each seal being opened up. You might recall that portion. Notice how we are commanded to pay special attention to each of them. Come and see. Come and see. Revelation chapter 6, the first seven verses. All these remarks are quite really useless and unnecessary additions to Scripture if we don't have the kind of duty to meditate upon providence. Psalm 66, verse 5. Come and see the works of the God. He is terrible in His doing toward the children of men. It's my duty to meditate and focus on the providence of God. So, how do I meditate on God's providence? We need to strive to get as complete and thorough an awareness as you can of all the providence of God for you from first to last. I will remember Psalm chapter 77. Have you thought back in your life the providence of God? How did you get here today how did you meet the people you've met in your life? How did you end up with a family that you have if it were not for the providence of God? It's good to rehearse those things and go back and say, God did that. I will remember. It's a key verse, Psalm 77, 11 and 12. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. It was November 2009. Some of you might well remember this particular event that happened in our city. As there were two individuals, Christian Benshoff, who's age 35, and his common law wife, Ashley Johnson, 25, both were, according to neighbors, were unemployed. And I'm reading a, a news report here. 
uh, and I'll add to it, kind of explain what was going on, but they'd robbed a bank at 120th and I think Sheridan. One day in midday, right around noon, back in November of 2009, and after leaving that bank with a bag full of money, they proceeded east on 120th and took the bag of money and threw it out of the car. They then turned on Federal and went down into the city of Westminster. Continue the report here. It says, police spotted the Subaru in a Safeway parking lot at 104th Avenue in Federal. It was there that the robbers shot at police through the rear window of the car, then drove north on Federal with officers in pursuit. Bullets flying from those suspects hitting several businesses in the area at lunch hour. It was clear that they didn't intend to flee the area at all, but rather anticipated to perhaps go out in a blaze of glory in a shootout with police officers. Something like Bonnie and Clyde, I guess. The report says the chase continued north with Commander Matt Rippey's patrol car directly behind the suspects. I talked to Matt Rippey this last week. I'm going to show you a picture in a moment. But uh, uh, Matt lives down in Arizona now. I maintain contact. Uh, he was in our service here about two months ago. When he's in Denver, he usually comes by. But he was the car that was directly behind the suspects. And uh, last night, he sent me an additional picture that I had not seen. This was immediately after the incident that concluded at 120th and Federal. And you'll see in this picture here, uh, as it says, the, uh, the, until police were able to use their cars to stop the Subaru in the intersection of 120th Avenue and Federal. Um, let me finish reading this. Two police officer, officers were wounded in the shootout, and on Friday, Westminster police officer Sean Chandler, who was shot in the hip and hospital, hospitalized at St. Anthony, was released. Uh, from our public information officer, he said, Sean is doing well, he's in good spirits. Deputy Chief Tim Carlson, who was riding in the car with, Tim, with uh, Officer Rippey, uh, they were going to lunch at the time, uh, and he ended up going and uh, riding with him. He was a, a, a deputy chief at the time, uh, Deputy uh, Tim Carlson. He was grazed by a bullet, uh, but did not require hospitalization. Uh, it was said that Carlson is doing well, but is fairly sore after the shooting. The bullet went under his vest as he's sitting in the car and just burned the skin, but that was it, did not penetrate it. I want you to notice in this picture of the Rippey's car at the time, uh, you'll notice, I hit the wrong button, here we go. Uh, okay, I knew I was gonna do that. Wrong direction, here we go. Okay, here's a patrol car. You'll notice the shell casings that are around the base of the car here, a very violent event that took place. Up here on the windshield, you might see this spot right here, right in front of the driver. That's a bullet hole right there. In the ensuing investigation after that, they'll use what they call these uh, uh, rods to determine, basically what they do is determine the path of a bullet so they can make sure of where that bullet came from, where it originated from. And it shows in this picture here that bullet hole in the windshield that Matt Rippey was driving. By the way, Matt Rippey and Tim Carlson are, are they were, could not be here this morning. Uh, Tim Carlson was wanting to come, but he had a serious accident at work here this last week or so. He's been a couple days in the hospital. He said they'll be watching online, so hello, Matt, and hello, Tim. Glad to have you with us. Uh, this is quite an event in their lives, traumatic event in their lives. You'll notice that the path of the bullet went through the windshield, through the corner of the dashboard in this Crown Victoria, and dead-ended on the steering wheel. If that bullet had been one inch higher or one inch lower, it would have struck Matt in the head, neck, or neck area, and probably would have killed him. Uh, as I was visiting with them shortly after the incident, in fact, it was very soon after that, I received a, a text message from Officer Rippey and sent me this picture. He said, I thought you'd be interested in this. And I've kept that picture. It's amazing. I sent him a text back, and I said, Matt, and Matt had trusted Christ just sometime before that 
here at Tri-City, an evangelistic meeting. I said, Matt, you need to make sure, this was on a Saturday, I said, you need to make sure you're in church tomorrow because your guardian angel just put in for a transfer. <laughs> he said, that was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. And he said, it was exactly what I needed right then. That was a traumatic event. Let me tell you, evidence of God. God did that. As we mentioned, Psalm 77, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders of old. I will meditate on all thy work and talk of all thy doing. God did that. And I'm going to remember it. A few years later, there was another event, late one evening in the south part of our city. Uh, an officer, Derek Rogers, pulled over a car whose license plate had been reported as stolen. There was a warrant for the car thief. And earlier that same day, the car thief had shot at a Denver police officer already. Before other officers could arrive on scene, the occupant of the stolen car exited the vehicle and faced Officer Rogers, who was standing beside his patrol car. The felon fired his weapon at the officer, striking him squarely in the chest. The suspect re-entered the stolen car and sped away while Officer Rogers returned fire. <laughs> Officer Rogers, and he was wearing his protective vest, which by the way, in case you're not aware, they're not bulletproof vests. They're bullet resistant, okay? They help a lot. They keep a lot of officers alive. But he remained standing beside his car, somewhat stunned by what had just happened. Normally taking a large caliber handgun round into a safety vest, would result in the wearer being knocked backwards and perhaps to the ground. It's a, a significant impact. If the round doesn't penetrate the vest, it will leave severe bruising in the impact area. But Officer Rogers was not knocked back at all. In fact, with his heightened senses, he was aware of the bullet striking him. Sometimes these things go into slow motion, these traumatic events. He was aware of the bullet striking him and then dropping to the ground in front of him. He picked up the bullet, noticing that it was not compressed or deformed in any way. Later analysis of the bullet revealed it had most likely, in that gun, been one round that was the wrong caliber. Didn't have any pressure behind it. That was the providence of God. A series of events that God put together to make sure when that ha event happened, that one round would be the round that was fired at Officer Rogers. So that we can look back and say, I will remember, behold your God. I'll remember, and I'll talk about that. How do we meditate on God's providence? Well, we view God as the one who authors and orders providences. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You, most of you could probably quote this passage. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. Acknowledge Him. Behold your God. We need to see the care of God. Behold. In our lives. Many of you, most of you, could give testimony of how God protected you miraculously at some point in your life. God's in control of all things. We need to see how God answers your requests. Sometimes before you even pray them, He's already answered. Do you remember those things? Do you talk about those things? You share that with others? See God's purpose and plan, at least as best you can understand His plan. Sometimes it's extremely difficult or maybe impossible to understand His plans, but as best you can, trust God. He is in control. If there is a calamity in the city, will not the Lord have done it? Amos chapter 3 and verse 6. Um, back in 2012, 
I know you'll remember this story as well. Got a couple short ones here. This was a story published by a British reporter about something that happened in Westminster. That's how broad this story was, how, how this story spread not only around our area or our state or our country, but this story was around the world. And a British reporter wrote this article. He said, Jessica Ridgway was only 10. But the little blonde girl was fiercely independent. With her own alarm clock, she liked to get herself up for school. She'd put on her pink and purple glasses, eat a granola bar, peel the oranges for her morning snack, and fill up her water bottle. On the morning of October 5th, 2012, Jessica followed her usual routine. Then she kissed her mother, Sarah, goodbye and left for school. It was snowing in the tree-lined suburban town of Westminster, Colorado. But Jessica was dressed for the weather in her blue jeans, black boots, and black jacket. Jessica usually met a friend at the end of the street, and the pair would walk to the Witt Elementary School together. But that day, Jessica's friend was left standing in the cold alone. Teachers called Sarah, her mother, to let her know that Jessica hadn't turned up. But Sarah, who worked nights, was still asleep. Getting the message hours later, she immediately reported her daughter missing. Police and almost 800 volunteers began an intensive search. Blocking off roads, pulling over cars, and knocking on doors, they urged people to report anything suspicious, and they scoured the icy hills and fields. Two days later, they found Jessica's Disney backpack and her water bottle about eight miles away from her home. Then, three days after that, a far more horrifying discovery. Human remains, identified as Jessica's torso, were found in a black bin bags, uh, black bin bags in, on open land. The rescue mission was over, but now police were searching for a killer. Close to the remains, officers found a small wooden cross necklace. Did that hold a clue to who had taken Jessica's life? Having ruled out her shattered family, police had no solid leads to go on. With a child killer at large in a close-knit community, people were frightened. I recall this was a media update on the case, on the, how the case was going, and that British officer, or excuse me, British reporter may well have been in this group, I don't know. I was in the second floor of the uh, police department uh, looking out the window, and I took a, this picture because uh, uh, Chief Lee Burke, who used to attend our church, who's a member, uh, he was giving the update on the Jessica Ridgway story, so I took this picture. Um, it was 24 hours around the clock that some 100 detectives from multiple agencies, local municipalities, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and the FBI all met at the Westminster Police Department. Every six hours, 24 hours a day, there was a debrief report for all, from all the investigation teams. And at the conclusion of those, I was introduced and, uh, was, and, and said that I was holding a prayer meeting for anyone in the department that would like to come. We prayed for God to reveal the murderer to authorities. That was the essence of our prayer request. There was, understand that there was no evidence, there was no leads, there was no progress for two weeks. It was at a dead end. I recently talked to those that were involved much in the, in the uh, investigation of this event. And I said, you know, that came that close to be an unsolved case would never be solved. He said, you're absolutely right. But we were praying, God, reveal the killer. Then almost two weeks after, a woman called with a, a police tip line. She recognized the cross necklace from a news report about the murder. She said it looked exactly like the one that belonged to her neighbor, Austin Sig. The caller expressed concerns about his behavior, saying that he dropped out of high school, had a strange obsession with death. So the cops brought Sig in and took a DNA sample and sent him home again. But a few days later, they received another call. This time, it was Austin Sig's mother. She asked for police to come over right away. Said, my son wants to turn himself in for the Jessica Ridgway murder. 
He said, this is Austin Sig, I murdered Jessica Ridgway. I have proof that I did. There is no other question. Uh, he said calmly, I'm giving myself up completely. There will be no resistance whatsoever. Rushing over to his house, I was on the phone. Police arrested him and charged him with, with the murder. He said this to investigators, there's no better way to describe what I've done than evil. It was clear to every officer during those couple weeks that what they were dealing with was righteousness versus unrighteousness. Good versus pure evil. How did it end? Miraculously. And I was able to point out, God did that. God did that. He answered prayer. I will remember to tell. And then, as we finish up, just about a year and a half ago, on New Year's Eve, a horrific fire swept through an area just west of the city of Westminster. It was a perfect storm of extreme dry conditions and violent winds over 100 miles an hour. Over 1,000 homes were totally destroyed. It was the Marshall Fire. And our church prepared this Y tract. Many of you distributed. You talked about it with those around you. And this tract addresses the question, why do bad things happen to good people? With a gospel presentation. That design was taken from a tract that I helped distribute in Ground Zero back in 2001 following the attacks at the World Trade Center. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. View God as one who authors and orders, providence says. We are to acknowledge Him. And in Amos chapter 3, verse 6, if there is a calamity in the city, will not the Lord have done it? Sometimes it may seem impossible to see the providence of God in these events, difficult events. But God sees all the pieces of the puzzle, the lives that are touched far beyond what we see. We need to trust, trust Him in those times and say, Behold, our God, He is in control. Let me ask you this morning, have you ever said, I wish I could see God do something. I want to see God work in my life. I want to see our, in our, work Him work in our church, in our city. I would sure like to see Him work in our nation. The providence of God. Matthew chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. It says, Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and sea obey him? Events in life that are described as beyond natural explanation are in fact supernatural. Events that defy physical laws of nature, we call a miracle. These events happen all around the world every day. Some try to explain it as, oh, that's just the random course of nature. Or uh, they might say, that's just an odd coincidence. Or perhaps they say, that's karma. But let me tell you, Jehovah God, the creator of the universe, did that. Today, God wants us to notice where He's at work. We need to boldly declare the works of our God to a lost and dying world all around us. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. <clears throat> and behold, the Lord God passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break into pieces the rocks before the Lord, and the Lord was not in the wind... And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, he ran the middle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him. It was the voice of the Lord, a still, small voice. Have you been obedient to the Lord in meditating on His providence 
remembering what he's done. And he is doing all around you. If you have, are you praising the Lord for his working in and around you? Are you telling others about what God has been doing? Will you be a small voice in the ears of those around you? That's why we're here. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool has said in the heart, Oh, there is no God. We're here to say, Behold your God. It's our responsibility to openly declare that's the providence of God. The God of the Bible, God did that. Let's pray. While your heads are bowed and eyes are closed for a moment, would you say today that, you know, I spend too much time focusing on, focusing on the corruption and problems I see all around, but I'm not spending much time to actually see where God is at work all around me. Now, this morning, would you say with me, I need to do what it says in Psalm 77. I will determine to purpose, purposely tell others how I see my God at work. I will remember and I will think on those things and talk more about how the Lord is working to those I interact with. Is that you today? Before we pray, would you just lift your hand so I can see it and then put it down again? I need to behold my God in a new and fresh way. Many, many hands, many hands. Perhaps the reason you haven't seen the Lord in events around you is that you don't have a personal relationship with the Jesus Christ. You've never invited him into your heart and life, asking him to forgive your sins, giving your life to him. Now, if that's you today, while eyes are closed and no one looking around, would you raise your hand so that I can pray for you and with you about that? I will not embarrass you or point you out. We're only here to help direct you to the Savior today. Anyone who never accepted Christ into their hearts and lives so that you're able to see where he's at work, Our Father, we rejoice and thank you for all that you do. Oh, Lord, may we take time to, to see where you are at work and praise you for those things and declare it to those around us boldly that they may also see our Savior. Strengthen us today. Bless us. Bless your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.